past as London. But what do you know of these curiosities? Where are they to be found? Little use in this case to ask a policeman. The remains of London stone, for example, in Cannon Street, set into the front wall of St. Swithin's Church, was erected by the Romans, and it's believed to be a malarium from which the lengths of roads fanning out from it were measured. The stone was built into the wall of St. Swithin's as a protection, and this it certainly proved to be, for the famous old church has twice been destroyed, first in the Great Fire of 1666, and again in the bombing of 1940. But London stone still endures. Here, outside the Royal Exchange, is a statue of the great Duke of Wellington astride his horse. But the sculptor forgot to supply him with either saddle, boots or spurs. Wellington, it seems, decided to fight the Battle of Waterloo in his stocking feet. Another odd memorial to a grim chapter of London's past is the bas-relief of the Last Judgment over the entrance arch of the Church of St. Stephen in Coleman Street. This is one of many memorials commemorating the Great Plague and the thousands of Londoners who succumbed to it. The relief depicts the resurrection of the dead with more than ordinary intensity, yet close examination reveals the incredible fact that practically no women or children appear to be arriving at the seat of judgment in the sculptor's mind. It was presumably a man's world then, now and forevermore. In the east end at the junction of Leadenhall and Fenchurch Streets, there stands the incredible Aldgate Pump. Here once stood a great priory with a holy well whose waters were renowned far and wide as having great healing powers. Today, the passerby may drink water from the same source at Aldgate Pump. London's riverside is alive with relics of the past. Here in Southwark, Shakespeare's plays were first performed in 1603. It was then called the Globe Theatre. It's now a warehouse. This locality was the playground of the Middle Ages. For those who took their fun too seriously, however, there was a prison called the Clink Prison, of which there are several local reminders. You all know the saying, he's in Clink. Well, this is where it began. But Southwark's most famous link with her boisterous past is the old George Inn, the last of London's great coaching inns. It was built in 1676, and its double row of wooden galleries are still intact. Plays were performed in the courtyards of public houses in the Middle Ages, and that was the reason for the galleries, not to tie up fractious steeds, as is commonly supposed. Charles Dickens was greatly attracted to the George. He used it as the meeting place for Mr. Pickwick and the immortal Sam Weller. Of the countless city churches damaged or destroyed during the bombing of London, one remains in the shadow of the tower, which presents a more tragic spectacle than most. It is All Hallows, the most ancient of the city churches. Founded in the year A.D. 675, it's now just a skeleton. It was the Guild Church and headquarters of Tark H, and for more than a thousand years, this has been a renowned place of worship for pilgrims and travelers from all over the world. Now, desolation pervades the shattered walls, and only the tower remains intact. Yet All Hallows is not quite deserted, for inside the crumbling walls, the battered floor has been cemented over, and when the weather permits, special services are held with the sky for roof and the wind as music. High in the tower still hangs the great bell, a majestic link with a glorious past, waiting for the bell ringers to man the ropes to proclaim this ancient sanctuary once more leader of all the city's churches. Close to the Corn Exchange in the heart of the city stands St. Olive's Church in Seething Lane. Here, over the gateway, we find another of London's memorials to the thousands who died in the Great Plague of 1665. This somewhat gruesome reminder marks the site of one of the common pits into which the plague victims were thrown, there being no time for customary funeral rites. In Shoreditch, the Church of St. Leonard also has an unpleasant link with the past. An old notice board refers in no uncertain terms to the administration of justice in the shape of stocks and whipping post. These relics of earlier times were in fact discovered some 50 years ago, carefully hidden away in the crypt of the church by one who no doubt thought they might come in handy another day. All kinds of people suffered detention in the stocks. Dishonest shopkeepers, roadside tramps, garrulous fishwives. Apart from being most uncomfortable for the victim, they had the additional advantage of being very amusing to the onlooker. And who likes to be laughed at in such a plight? In 
In Aldersgate, at the back of the great general post office, is a small park called locally Postman's Park. It is in reality a churchyard and belongs to the Church of St. Bottle. The chance wayfarer, wandering in this secluded spot, may discover a small covered arcade bearing the inscription, in commemoration of heroic self-sacrifice. The arcade was erected at the wish and expense of the famous artist G.F. Watts, and there are now some 50 memorial plaques lining its walls, each plaque recording an act of heroism by some humble soul, which otherwise would long since have been forgotten. Come closer and read for yourself. Alfred Smith, police constable, who was killed in an air raid while saving the lives of women and girls, June 13, 1917. Dr. William Lucas, who saved a child's life on October 8, 1893, by experimenting with poison and sacrificing himself. David Sells, age 12, who struggled to save a drowning playmate off Woolwich on September 12, 1886, and was drowned himself also. Since the deaths of both the artist and his wife, the church wardens of St. Botolph's have made themselves responsible for the upkeep and extension of the arcade. And so a garden of remembrance lives on in the heart of a great city. Among the most famous curiosities of London is the renowned old curiosity shop itself. This amazing little shop, sandwiched between two much larger buildings, stands in Portsmouth Street at the back of the enormous Stoll Theatre off Kingsway. And there it is known to have been for the past 300 years or more. Despite its age, the shop always has a shining, freshly painted appearance. Maybe it was this pristine air that so attracted Charles Dickens. And in his imagination, the little shop became the home of enchanting Little Nell and her aged grandfather. Today, it is filled with rare china, fabulous first editions of the great writers, and the 101 precious articles that go to make the old curiosity shop an antique collector's paradise. But more than a curiosity, a phenomenon, in fact, is found on Highgate Hill, an ancient milestone made famous by a 14th century kitchen boy. But you know the rest of the story. This is the milestone young Richard Whittington was resting upon when he heard the chimes of Bow Bells that were to bring him fame and prosperity. Turn again, Whittington, thrice Lord Mayor of London. The square must be familiar to everyone. But did you know that a hundred years ago a large part of it consisted of the royal stables of King George IV? And something more curious still remains in the square to this day, the imperial standards of length. By Act of Parliament in 1878, the imperial standards of length were laid down as the distance between certain gold studs set in a bar of bronze, and a copy of the bar. So if you don't think your tape measure is correct, this is the place to test it. But the most noble sight in the square is a lamp, four lamps to be exact. They mean nothing to you? They should for they are the deck lamps of Nelson's flagship, Victory. The lamps the great admiral saw on the eve of Trafalgar. The same lamps that watched over the battered ship during the sad voyage homeward. Have you ever noticed the porter's rest in Piccadilly? This is a stout plank supported by two iron columns, which was used to rest loads of merchandise in the days when men carried everything upon their backs, including women. Though today perhaps the position is in reverse, porter's rest is still there. Off Piccadilly lies the famous Shepherd's Market where despite a sophisticated reputation, streets and houses have the most rural names. Thus we see Farm Street, Hayes Mews, Hay Hill, and so forth. To say nothing of the enchanting Cobble Court Cottage, transplanted straight from the pages of a storybook, and final proof that Piccadilly once lay in the depths of the countryside. Along just behind Kensington Gardens, there's a cemetery, the only one of its kind in central London, and quite unique. It's a cemetery for cats and dogs. Here, in this delightful spot, quiet and secluded, seemingly hundreds of miles from the roar of the great city, Londoners have buried their pets through the years. The affectionate regard of man for his dumb and faithful friends is here revealed again and again in all its pathetic sincerity. Snap. Duchess died in 1901. Dear little smut. Sweet Kitty Rose. The barks and mews are silent, 
but the memories linger on. From Bayswater to Hampstead Heath and the haunts of the notorious Dick Turpin, the terror of the menfolk, the idol of the ladies. In no corner of the Heath was he so well known as at the Spaniards Inn, for this famous old wayside tavern was one of his favourite resorts, and here his presence was both loved and feared by all. Turpin had the key to the door of the Spaniards, and an excellent vantage point it was, whilst lying in wait for the lumbering stagecoach as it came clattering by the old toll house opposite. Together they still stand, the Spaniards and the toll house, an excellent combination with the narrow roadway between. No longer stand and deliver, but a considerable hold up all the same to the ever increasing demands of the King's Highway and the challenge of modern traffic. Almost as celebrated as the Spaniards Inn, and less than half a mile away on the top of the heath, is Jack Straw's Castle, an old tavern whose beginnings are almost legendary. Jack Straw was a notorious peasant who lived on the heath in the days of King Richard II, 600 years ago. The original tavern took the name of this turbulent upstart and has borne it ever since. Gone are the famous stables and tea gardens, and a favourite out-of-town rendezvous for the young gallants and their fair ladies centuries ago is now superseded by the juvenile pleasures of the very young on the pond nearby, which daily becomes more famous as one of London's landmarks. For it overlooks London's newest playground, Hampstead Heath. The gay haunts of yesterday, Southwark, Vauxhall, Battersea and the rest are now forgotten. So let's all gather on the heights of Hampstead and enjoy all the fun of the fair. I hope you can hear me. As I was saying just now, here it seems we can all go mad and learn how to crash cars with the best girl and patronise the most antediluvian devices which are guaranteed to dissipate all the benefits of the new medical service. First time round you lose your spectacles, second time round you lose your teeth, third time round you lose your lunch. ancient relics and treasures of antiquity now. In spite of the gaudy lights and the loudspeakers, this sort of thing is old 